two verses came to my mind as we sang, Amy, those last two songs. Uh, the first one, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Uh, we bear none of that. Having come to the cross of Jesus Christ, trusting him as our Savior, he washed it all away. In the other verse, this last song, Jesus said, He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. When we come to the Lord, he listens, he wraps his arms around us, he draws us to himself. We are his, safe and secure for all of eternity. All glory, all praise to our Heavenly Father, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Loving Father, thank you. Thank you for what you have done. We deserve only your wrath. We deserve only your judgment. But you and your grace and mercy sent the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven to this earth to die for our sin. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We're overwhelmed by your love this morning. And Father, if there's one here in this place, in this sanctuary today, who has yet not come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that this day they would say yes to our precious Savior who gave his life for them. Do that work in hearts. Open our hearts to your word today. Speak, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you ever haven't already turned there, turn to Joel chapter 2, the passage that uh, was read earlier. If you're having trouble finding it, once you get to the end of the major prophets, you start the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, he's the second one. And uh, that helps me to remember. Plus, this handy little thing that my Bible helps me remember. I just, <laughs> I put it there. <laughs> so I'm not flipping pages constantly. <laughs> In the mid-1800s, Samuel Francis, a teenage boy, stood on a bridge over the Thames River in London, thinking about jumping into the river and ending his life. But that night, God's love reached deeper into his heart and life, and he responded in renewed faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. A few years after that, he wrote of what had, he had realized and learned firsthand that night on that lonely bridge in London. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me, underneath me, all around me is the current of his love, leading onward, leading homeward to thy glorious rest above. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Spread his praise from shore to shore. How he loveth, ever loveth, changeth never, never more. When Jesus began his final trip to Jerusalem, this time to fulfill the reason he had left heaven to come to earth, he said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles. He will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon and after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. Within a week of saying those words to his disciples, Jesus was in Bethany, ready to go the next day into Jerusalem for those things to occur. Why would he do it? Why would he go to where this would happen to him? And we, we know the answer. We state it so quickly. Uh, we, sometimes the, the verses of God's word, we, 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 we put them in our heart and, and we sometimes just say them. We really don't think of what is really being said in that verse. 
And so the answer of why he would do it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and unique son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He did this for our forgiveness and our eternal life. Jesus had come because of his love. Not only for the Jews, but for all mankind. And that love would be seen so clearly at the end of that week when he hung on the cross. But that love was seen that day as well that he rode into Jerusalem as he rode the donkey's colt over the top of the Mount of Olives coming into the view of the city of Jerusalem. We're, we're told that Jesus cried over it. Some translations say cried over it. Luke 19, 41. And we read those words so matter-of-factly and give just fleeting attention to them and, and we think some discomfort and a few tears is what Jesus said. But Luke's description is much more vivid through the words that he chose to express it. Much more specific. Jesus wept. He cried out loudly. He sobbed, folks. He sobbed. The word that's translated wept there is the same word that's used talking about Peter when the rooster crowed after Jesus, after he had denied Jesus three times, the rooster crowed, Peter was broken, sobbing. And it's the same word that's translated about the mothers who have lost their children when Herod killed the babies in Bethlehem. Sobbing. Jesus' heart was broken for the people. You know, as we were discussing, Lynette, Lynette and I were talking a couple of weeks ago about this message a little bit. She shared an observation from a recent Bible study that she had participated in with a group of ladies. And the observation was, we know a lot about God, but do we really know God in the depth of understanding and relationship that he wants to be there? We want a little bit of God. But do we want all of God? You know, we can answer many of the questions. How much do we know God? God can do any, everything. And we quickly list things that God can do. In that little course, God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. God is. And we list these characteristics of what it means to, to be a person. God is living. God is active. God is emotional. God is volitional. He makes choices. And we can say God is, and we list several of the attributes of God. That he is eternal. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is perfect. But do we really know God in the depth of the relationship that he wants to have with us, or are we still holding him at arm's length? And folks, I, I realize we're going to be talking about Joel, but I'm, we're saying all of this right up front, because the key question as we read Joel is how much do we know God? How much do we really know of our Heavenly Father? And how much do we really want to know about him? Because as Joel talks, there are some difficult things that Joel is talking about. The, uh, what Joel is speaking of here, and, and it will change next week a little bit, because it's, it's the other half of, of chapter 2, and it's talking about the repentance. When you come to Joel chapter 3, the judgment is there. How much do we really know God? How can we understand Jesus' broken heart and loud, loud sobbing over the city of Jerusalem if we really don't understand the totality of his love, not only for the Jew, but also for all of mankind? How can we understand what God is saying through Joel to the nation of Israel unless we know the heart of God? And to know God, then we will understand what he is saying. And so... We come to Jewel 2 this morning where God is saying, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. But if we don't understand God's relationship with the Jew, the nation of Israel, 
How can we understand what he's saying in Joel 2? If we don't understand God's relationship with us, how can we understand how this also applies to us? Because it does. And so this morning, we're going to look first of all at what God did and what God is going to do. Secondly, why God did, did this and why he's going to do what he's going to do in the future. And third, what does this have to, what does this have to do with us? What God did and what he's going to do. Well, God chose them. God chose them. About 2100 B.C., God reached out in love to an idol-worshipping man living in southwest modern Iraq and said to that man whose name was Abram, and he later changed his name to Abraham, he said, I will make of you a great nation. I will make your name great, and through you I will bless all the families of the earth. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And with this man and his descendants, God made a covenant, which he, God, the Abrahamic covenant, God has continued to keep and will keep all the way to the moment that he takes us home to be with him. God reaffirmed that covenant to his, that man's descendants, first to his son Isaac and later to his son, his grandson Jacob. And these that Joel is writing to are the descendants of that man. God chose him. Secondly, God delivered his people, the descendants of this man. God delivered them from death and despair. God preserved their lives in Egypt when they were there for 430 years. And they went in there uh, to, to save their lives. Joseph was there, and, and they were, God sent them into Egypt, and the famine was going on, and they were kept alive and a place to live, and, and they prospered and did very well. But things changed somewhere during that period of time they were there. And when you get to the end of that 430 years, they had been slaves, and they were being murdered. Their babies were being thrown in the Nile River. And God delivered them from that, from death and despair. And then he sent a deliverer by the name of Moses to take them from Egypt's bondage and death to Canaan's freedom and life. And 40 years later, Moses stood on the bank of the Jordan River with the children who had come out who had been born in that 40 years in the wilderness. He's, he's standing there with them because the older generation has died out and, and the promised land is in front of them and Moses is talking to them and he said, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples for you were the, fear, the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, God's choice, God chose you because he loved you. Because he chose you in love, he brought you up out of Egypt's slavery. That's Deuteronomy chapter 7. God chose them. God delivered them from death and despair. Third, he told them how to live. At Mount Sinai, God made a covenant, a Mosaic covenant, with them and gave them the law and the sacrificial system. He told them that they were to be holy because he is holy. Leviticus 19.2. And through great descriptions, he told them, he showed them what that holiness was to look like. We're talking, this is what God has done. This is what God has done for them. And what he's going to do. And then having brought them to the Jordan River, ready to enter the promised land, God through Moses spoke to that generation and he said, Okay, children of Israel, hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live. And may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I give you. Deuteronomy 4. 
Be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. And by the way, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. Within, within two generations, they walked away. He said, be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and revering him. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and decrees that I'm giving you today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify today that you surely will be destroyed like the nations destroyed before you. So you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. Pretty tough, tough stuff, isn't it? Yeah. God told them how to live. And then God disciplined them to bring them back to himself. If we think love... We... <laughs> We, we, think, we think of love, and love is this huge emotion in our heart. And, and it is. But that's just the beginning. Because First Corinthians 13 talks about love and gives all those descriptors there, our verbs. Love does this, it does that, it does that, it does that. And when you get further, you get into Hebrews, it says that God disciplines those that he loves. God, third, God disciplines. He tells them how to live and then he disciplines them to bring them back to himself. Within three generations, they turned away from God. They embraced idolatry, the practices of their sinful neighbors. And over the next 300 years, God disciplined them as they went through 12 cycles of obedience, disobedience, captivity, cry for help, deliverance by a judge, peace, and then disobedience again. That whole period of the judges, for 300 years, they kept turning away from God. They cried out to God. He forgave them. He delivered them. They were comfortable, and they turned away from God again. This around and around and around and around for 300 years. When the kingdom divided after Solomon died, Israel in the north never had a king from David's family line, and they never had a godly king, Israel in the north. As a nation, they continued to walk away from God. Judah in the south did have some prophets who sought to bring them back to God, prophets to whom they would listen. And their kings were all from David's line, but some of those kings were very bad as well. Joel, or Yoel, the Hebrew pronunciation of this, was one of those prophets that were there. He was very possibly the first writing prophet during the divided kingdom. There's a question uh, in terms of Obadiah could have been just a little bit earlier, but possibly not as well. As Joel wrote to Judah, there had been 20 plus years of continued evil, wickedness in the land, followed by a small, tiny little window of obedience to God, only to turn away from them again. The nation of Judah is worshiping idols. They've forsaken the temple. They have murdered an innocent man, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, who's t who was trying to, to turn them back to God, and they, they put him to death. And as God speaks to Judah through the voice of Joel, he tells them that what they have already experienced in the locust plague is God's discipline for their sin and their rebellion. And the locusts should have been enough to turn them back to God. But they didn't. They didn't. And they weren't coming back to God. And so God warns them about their continued rebellion. They knew how they were supposed to live. They knew the relationship of love and obedience that they were to have for God. And Yoel was telling them that they needed to repent. They needed to repent. They needed to turn back to God. If they didn't, much more severe judgment 
was going to come upon them. He said, cry out to the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is near as destruction from the Almighty. It comes, Joel 1, verses 14 and 15. Cry out to God. Turn back to the Lord. 200 years later, to the, those Jews who were still in Babylon who didn't go back, Ezekiel is writing, and he and, and, and writes there, I will judge you, God says, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one of according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest your iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed. Make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure, God says. I have no pleasure in the death of any anyone declares the Lord so turn and live Amen. and that's what he's saying to the Jews in captivity who didn't go back that's what he's saying to the Jews right there in Jerusalem that Yoel is proclaiming and preaching to God chose them God delivered them from death and despair he told them how to live he disciplined to bring them back to himself he warned them about their continued rebellion he loved them too much to leave them in their sin. And folks, God loves us too much to leave us in our sin. So God told them what his judgment would bring. Is the day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is near. It's not a day. It is not a day. It's not a day of man. It's not a day of political power and leaders. It's not the day of Satan, the day of the Antichrist. It is the day of the Lord, the day of God's sovereignty and his judgment upon this world. And it is not a single day. It's a period of wrath and judgment uniquely belonging to Almighty God, revealing his holiness, his power, and his justice. It's a time referring to the end time events. It's a time period that refers to those events. It includes the tribulation, the second coming of Christ, the millennial kingdom, the great white throne judgment, the end of the millennium. Its purpose is to discipline Israel, to bring them back to himself, to judge sinful mankind, and bring an end to the devil's influence and corruption of God's creation. It's to make, bring everything to a conclusion and God's holiness and a complete change a complete change the day of the Lord is near for those who are enemies of God Yoel states chapter 1 verse 15 it's associated with destruction from Almighty God Chapter 2, verse 2, as Brian read earlier, it's a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Chapter 2, verse 11, it's great and terrible. Who can endure it? Chapter 2, verses 30 and 31, there will be blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Chapter 3, verse 15, the sun and the moon darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. It's the time of God's judgment poured out on sinful man. For the righteous, it'll be a time of blessing for those who repent. And it will be the rule of Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune God, for 1,000 years and the blessings of God that are going to be there at that time. Chapter 3 and verse 18. During the day of the Lord, there will be seismic disturbances, signs in the heavens, Chapter 2 and chapter 3. There'll be violent weather, Ezekiel 13. Be clouds and thick darkness, Zephaniah 1. Upheaval in the heavens, chapter 2 of, of UL. Great and terrible day that will come as destruction from the Almighty. And then Joel, as Joel writes, he gives us great detail about what's going to happen. And I'm just going to walk down the verses with you. You've got it open before you. He says, and blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and, and thick darkness. Sound the, the alarm, the, blow, the, blow the trumpet, sound the shofar. 
That's the ram's horn. And that, was, that horn was used to, to announce sacrifices and feasts, to assemble people to meet, to warn of danger, and to call the army to arms at the battle. This is a day of darkness and gloom, clouds and thick darkness. There is no hope. And like blackness, like blackness, a vast sea of people, an army covers the horizon greater than has ever been seen or ever will be seen. That's what Joel, Joel is describing. Verses 3 through 5. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run, as with the rumbling of chariots they leap on the tops of mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Like locusts, this army will destroy everything in sight. The land is beautiful before them. It is devastated after they pass. I was watching Fox News um, yesterday afternoon uh, for a few minutes, and they were showing some pictures of Ukraine and the one city the one where the, the Russians are attacking right now, I think it's Bakhmut, and uh, uh, they, they didn't show the pictures of the, of the city before, but they said before, it was a beautiful city. And now, the, and they showed on the screen yesterday, just the pictures of the tall rise apartment buildings. Everything's blown out. There's not a window anywhere. There's just rubble everywhere, death in every direction that you look. That's what's coming, as you well speaks. Verse 6, before them peoples are in anguish, all, peop all faces grow pale there. They, the ones being attacked are in anguish and terror. Death and destruction will be everywhere. Seven through nine, like warriors they charge. Like soldiers they scale the wall. They march each on his own, each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. This army is relentless. It is relentless. They march forward in waves and formations. The weapons used against them do not slow them down. They burst through the weapons, verse 8. They are not stopped. It says they leap on the city. They run into walls. They climb into houses. They go through the windows. This is an attacking army. The army is invisible, or excuse me, invincible, verses 10 and 11. The earthquakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, the stars withdraw their shining. <clears throat> the Lord utters his voice before his army. For his camp is exceedingly great. He who ex executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? There are signs in the earth and the sky which no earthly king or army commander could do. The commander of this army is who? It's God. It is God. God is going to come, <coughs> excuse me, in judgment on his people, <coughs> excuse me, who refuse to repent, who continue to rebel. He has warned them repeatedly and will continue to warn. <clears throat> he has warned them for centuries and will continue to warn. But there's a day coming when God is going to say, enough. Enough. The time of repentance will be passed and God's judgment is going to come. Now, when will this happen? <clears throat> when you look at eschatology uh, in the Old Testament, sometimes there's a near fulfillment along with the 
eschatological, the long-term fulfillment. Yoel says, the day of the Lord is near. There's judgment coming. There's a final judgment that's coming. I don't know. Can you check it, Brian? It may be. There's a, a near judgment, and uh, thank you. There's, sometimes there's a near judgment and a long-term far judgment. There's a near judgment that's going to come on them, plus the long-term, the far judgment coming upon all mankind at the end. Directly north of Israel and Judah was the Assyrian Empire, centered at Nineveh. And we remember Nineveh in that because Jonah was sent to Nineveh to proclaim. And what was his word? Repent. They repented. But then they changed their mind. And went back to doing the things they were doing before. They were growing exponentially. They were conquering and enslaving nations and people. In 722 B.C., 75 years after Yoel's prophecy, King Sargon II of Assyria marched his army south and conquered Israel. God had said through Yoel that repent because the day of the Lord, judgment is near. 75 years after he said that, the Assyrian army came down into Israel, carried them off into captivity, and the nation of Israel in the north ceased to exist forever. 20 years later, King Sennacherib of Assyria tried to do the same thing to Judah during Hezekiah's reign. The difference was Hezekiah prayed. When he got the letter from, from the Assyrians saying, we're coming down and we want all your stuff, Hezekiah took it to God and he prayed. God sent one angel, just one. And that night, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers died. One angel. Ninety years after that, a coalition of Babylonians and Medes defeated the Assyrian Empire in 612 B.C., and now Babylon is the ruling power. And in 605 B.C., then 597 to 586, Babylon conquered Judah and carried away her citizens into captivity. In less than 200 years, the near fulfillment of Yoel's prophecy was fulfilled. God said, turn to me. Turn to me. Turn from your sin. Walk with me. Live for me. Obey me. Oh, God, we're going to do what we want. In 200 years, they were gone. Yoel's prophecy for both Israel and Judah was now fulfilled, but not completely, because the final day of the Lord still lies ahead for all mankind. This is what God did and is going to do. Brings us to our second consideration this morning is why? Why? Why did God do this? Why will he do this in the future? Why would God be the commander of the army that destroys his people? Well, because they rejected him. They forgot God. They turned away from him. Yoel's prophecy, God had told them to walk with him, to love him, to serve him, to worship only him. Their obedience was only short term. Within two generations, they were already embracing the false religions that were around them. They were rebelling against all that God had told them to do. God had waited for centuries for them to walk with him. For centuries, God waited for 680 years for Israel to turn back to him. 800 years for Judah to turn back to him. But because of the continued rebellion and refusal to submit and repent, God brought the armies upon them to judge his people. When Jesus 
entered Jerusalem, he wept. They rejected. They forgot God. They turned away from him. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, he wept because they were rejecting him. They rejected God, God the Father in the Old Testament. And Christ had come to be the Lamb of God, and they rejected him. They rejected the Son. And he said, the day is coming when they will be destroyed because they did not recognize his coming. They refused to believe in him. Luke 19, 43 and 44. 37 years later after the cross and the resurrection, Israel was no more because the Romans came in and killed everyone that stood in their way. Jerusalem burned, the temple destroyed, and Israel ceased to exist. Why did God do it? Because they forgot their God. They rejected him. And why did God do it? Because of God, who God is and what he is like. When Moses asked God to show him his glory, Moses asking God, God, show me your glory. God said when he revealed himself to Moses, he, as he passed by and Moses is covered by God's hand, God said, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and truth, who keeps his steadfast love for thousands, who forgives iniquity and transgressions and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren of the third and fourth generation. God does not wink at sin. So what is God like? What is God like? How would you describe him? You know, we could go down a long list of God's attributes, but I want to just share five of them real quickly. God is love. God is love, isn't he? Yeah. He said, of, he said of Israel, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with kindness. God said he would never forget them. Others may forget, but I will not forget. I've, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God is love. And because of his love, God disciplines his children. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects his son in whom he delights. Proverbs 3.12. Love does not leave a loved one in their rebellion <coughs> and rejection, but instead seeks to restore them to a right relationship with him, with God. God is love. God is holy. Holiness means to be separate from, to be set apart from all that is evil, morally unclean, sinful. Holiness is the very center of all that God is. He's, he's absolutely separate from all that is evil, morally unclean, sinful. Everything that God does, all of his acts are holy. And God's instruction to his children in the Old Testament, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19.2. And God's holiness demands holiness in his people. When they entered the land of Canaan, God said, you are not to be like the nations who were there. He commanded them to destroy those nations. And if they didn't, those nations would be thorns in their sides and they would be corrupted by the sin that was around them. God is love. God is holy. God is righteous and just. God's righteousness means that he always does what is good and right in conformity to his law as given in his word. His righteousness is seen in requiring perfect righteousness in mankind. Leviticus 19.15, you are to do no wrong in judgment and measurement or capacity, but must have just balances and a just measurement. God's righteousness is seen in his in his chastening his people. Daniel 9, 14, the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us for our God. The Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. 
God is faithful. Know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps His covenant in His loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandment. Deuteronomy 7, 9. God's faithfulness is everlasting. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. Psalm 119, 90. What God has said He will do, He will do. God promised in the garden, I will send the one who will defeat this serpent. I will send the one who will defeat him. I will send the one who will bring redemption for mankind. God could not and would not accept the continued rebellion of his children and the continued evil that Satan has brought to this world. It will be judged. The day of the Lord is coming when God's love, God's faithfulness, God's holiness, God's righteousness, God's justice will bring all of this world system and mankind's rebellion to an end. And Jesus Christ will reign as King of Kings. Now, third, very quickly, and I'm looking at the time. What does this all have to do with us? What does it all have to do with us? This is not just the nation of Israel. Remember what they were? They were chosen. We are chosen. We are chosen. Paul said chosen in him before the foundation of the world. They were delivered from death and despair. God has delivered us from death and despair. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he has made us alive with Christ. Ephesians 2. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God told them how they were to live. God has told us how we are to live. We are to be imitators of God as beloved children. Ephesians 5.1 As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, so you are to be holy in all of your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 1 God disciplined them. God disciplines us. We have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Should we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good that we might share in his holiness. Hebrews 12, 9 through 10. God loves us too much to leave us where we're at. And sin is to have no part in our life. We're to be dead to sin's presence, to sin's power, and to sin's practice. Romans chapter 6, Paul says. Peter said, since the day of the Lord is coming, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Second Peter 3. We are to be lights for the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. We are to be that salt, that preservative in this world. Matthew 5. We're to be lights for Jesus Christ. We watched the message last night that Tim preached last Sunday morning. Here. God gave us the gospel to take into this world. Are we? Are we? We're to be that light for Jesus Christ in this world. Not rebelling like they were. Are we taking the light into the world? Are we the light the salt in this world. That's the question that, that, that each of us individually must ask. I have to ask myself, I, just driving out here this morning, thinking, what, what 
what do I need to be doing that I'm not doing right now? And God has already pounded on my heart with at least one thing. We live in a, folks, we live in a culture, in a world that is falling apart. We live in a culture, in a world where evil is doing everything that it can to rule and to reign. We live in a culture, in a world that we may soon not recognize any part of it. This world is not our home. Why do we hold it so dearly? Why do we cherish the things of it? We put so much effort and expense in things that will not last. We can't take with us when we leave. Why are we so weak and timid when Jesus said we have the Holy Spirit living within us to help us be the witness for the Lord Jesus Christ in this world? Jesus said, when I, he said well, I'm going to leave. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he will give you the power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And we have have that information we know it and we do so little with it so much of the time and if we are not being that witness by our life and by our words then we are not doing what God said to do and God loves us too much to leave us in disobedience and he will turn up the heat a little bit to get us moving because the world needs to hear the day of the Lord is coming, folks. It is coming. This is not just a phrase. It is coming. And we have no conception of how bad it's going to be for this world. And we have, we have loved ones who are going to go through it and who will perish in the middle of it, who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. We have neighbors who will perish in this. If it, if it started today, we have neighbors who would perish because they don't know Christ as Savior. And have we told them? Have we told them? I, I, as Tim preached last week, as he talked, he's talking about the gospel. It's, and it, as he ended it, he said, from faith to faith. And I watched him shake hands from faith to faith, passing it on. Are we passing it on? The day of the Lord is coming. Are we passing the message on? Are we living for Jesus Christ in this world? God's day of judgment will soon be here. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you God's child? Have you come to faith in Jesus Christ? Only in him is there hope when the day of the Lord comes. It is coming and nothing in this world will give us forgiveness, peace, certainty, stability, and security. Only Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, can and will do that. He alone is our help and our hope. He alone is our help and our hope. And so I would ask you, have you and are you resting in that deep, deep love of the Lord Jesus Christ that we talked about at the very beginning. Loving Father, thank you. We know your word tells us what's coming. We know as we believe your word. Are we a light, God? Are we the light you want us to be in this world? Turn up the heat and convict us so that we confess the sin and become that light that you have called us to be. Lord, help us to share the message of Jesus Christ, for he alone is the only hope of this world. We praise you for that deep love of our Savior. And for those who have not yet come to Jesus and, and accepted and rested in that love, may they do it this day, this morning, in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing just one verse. Number 24. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Would you stand with me, please? Just the first verse. Number 24.
the Lord Jesus Christ loved us. He came to this earth. He went to the cross to die for my sin, for yours, and all that we know around us. He died for them. Let's be that light and tell them so they can know that love of the Lord Jesus Christ. The day of the Lord is coming. It could even begin very, very quickly. God, to you, the praise and the glory, we give it all in Jesus' name. Amen.